welcome to PCC's live broadcast on Sunday. So welcome to the whole PCC family and those of you watching worldwide on the internet. It's a great day here in London. The sun is shining. Summer is finally here. So if you're with somebody, give them a handshake, give them a hug, tell them summer is finally here. Better things are ahead. Yeah, so we're just going to go straight off into praise and worship. I know we are not together live, but get involved in praise and worship. It's not a spectator sport. You're supposed to participate in it. So put down your books, put down your laptops, get on your feet and start worshipping the Most High God. Because I know, I'm sure God has missed us getting together to praise and worship Him. But we can still do it here online. So shake yourselves off, get off your sofas, jump on your feet and we'll now go straight into praise and worship. God bless you.
for your mercy never fails me and all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment when I wake up until I lay my head oh I will sing of the goodness of God
We had a good time praising and worshiping God, jumping, praising God, so that He does not miss us being together because we are still together on air. So, my name is Kofi Inti. I'm one of the staff ministers at Praise Christian Center. Pastor Kofi and pa Pastor Jane are out at the moment. They'll be back next week. I just want to thank you, Pastor Kofi, for giving me a chance to preach from your pul pulpit. Much appreciated. Well, today we're going to look at a topic called Press Forward 2. Bold thinking, bold actions. Tap somebody next to you. Tell them, press forward with bold thinking and bold actions. At the beginning of the year, we did press forward one, prayer. But today, we're going to be looking at bold thinking and bold actions. But before we start, let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. I'm reading from the New King James Version. So Revelation chapter 3, verse 18. So this was Jesus. You know, John had a revelation in, um, whilst he was on the island. And this was Jesus speaking to him. Jesus said to him, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. So Jesus was saying, anoint your eyes with eyesight that you may see. If you notice throughout the Bible, especially with the prophets, God always came to them and said, see, can you see what I'm saying? Because you can hear something, you may doubt it. You can feel something, you may doubt it. But when you see something, you know it's there. There's no way you can be shaken. And also in your inner man, if your inner man, your heart, sees something, all doubts disappear. So Jesus will say, get eyes out, anoint your eyes so that you may see. So before we start, we're just going to spend two minutes asking God, Father, anoint our eyes with our eyes out. If you notice, Paul prayed a similar prayer, the eyes of our understandings be flooded with light. So raise up your voices, call unto God, Father, let me see what you're saying. Let me see your word in my inner man. Let me see your word in my heart. Anoint my eyes with eye self. Open my eyes to behold the wondrous things in your law, Father. So just raise up your voices. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for your word of power. Thank you for sending your word to us, Father. Anoint our eyes with eye self. Let us see what you are saying, Father. Flood it with light, Father, so that we just don't hear it, but we see it in our inner man. We catch a hold of it so our lives will be fully transformed. We give you the glory, Father. Thank you so much. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. So let's go to John chapter 14, verses 12 to 14. So John 14, 12 to 14. But before we start, I'd written the message down, but just this morning, the Holy Spirit was just ministering to me something, not different, but along the lines, about the kingdom of God. Remember, everything really we Christians do on this earth is about the kingdom of God. If not, there is no reason for you and I to be on this earth. I've never read a book or heard a testimony about anybody saying they went to heaven and they asked God to send them back to earth. Not a single testimony. Everybody who goes there, even when they're prayed for and they come back, they say, why did you pray for me to come back? I want to go back. Yeah, so the main reason you and I are here, are here is to expand the kingdom of God. Everything else is secondary. The main priority is everything should be about the kingdom of God. So as we're going through this preaching, and teaching, don't think it's about me, my family, and my environment. No, 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 no. The main purpose is how can I further enhance the kingdom of God? How can I push the purposes of God forward? Like Jesus said, the zeal of your house has consumed me. That should consume me in all your thinking, everything that you're doing, going to work, going to church, even your leisure time, everything, your focus must be, this is the reason why. 
you know, whilst I was thinking about this, I had to actually define why I was on this earth. Because when I thought about it, I thought, well, I'm a teacher in the school. I teach the, the children. And their results, just some of them, we just sort of mark their papers. I wanted to get A's, B's, C's. That was good. But then God says, what about the kingdom of God? So I had to step back. I had to redefine my role. And I had to change the role and say, no, I'm not a teacher of business studies. I'm here to move the children into their maximum potential in Christ. You have to get them to hit their life's destiny in Christ. So now I have to change everything the way that I teach. I have to make them know that I'm a Christian, that everything that I'm teaching them is actually coming because I'm based, I'm, be, I'm being a Christian. Even though I cannot preach to them from, the, from, from teaching, I must find a way to make sure the kingdom of God is advanced there. So whilst you're going through this, always think, be kingdom-minded. How can we push this forward for the kingdom of God? And if you notice something about the kingdom of God, you notice what Paul says. He says, I did not come to you with nice words of wisdom, nice speaking, nice principles. No. He said, I came to you with the demonstration of the spirit and the power of God so that your faith would rest in the power of God. If you look throughout the scriptures, the New Testament, the scriptures are a miracle book. There's nothing normal about the Bible. God did not come, and come here to come and teach us about normal. No. We have been elevated into a different kingdom, a kingdom of God. And in the kingdom of God, God expects us to demonstrate the spirit and the power of God. So you notice even Jesus, after he trained his 12 disciples, he said, wait in Jerusalem. Wait to be endued with power from on high before you go out. And when the power descended, Peter just had to open his mouth. Thousands of people were being saved. So we have to keep that in mind that as we are children of God, as we've entered this kingdom of God, our whole mindset should be about how can I turn things around for the kingdom of God? And I must, I must demonstrate the spirit and the power of the almighty God. So John chapter 14, verses 12 to 14. This is what Jesus was saying. So just before he was about to go, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, ask yourself, do I believe in Jesus? Well, if you believe in Jesus, this is what he's saying. He who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he, he, he will do because I go to my Father, and whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. But the main thing Jesus was saying that the things that he has come to do, it wasn't for us to glorify God and just worship him. No, he was giving us a template, an example of what our lives are meant to be like. If you notice, he didn't say, those who are in ministry. He didn't say the pastors, the bishops, the archbishops, the pope. No, he said, he who believes in me. Anybody. You may be working in any department. In fact, when you read the book of the Acts of the Apostle, it always challenges me. Stephen and Philip, they were in the, in the sort of catering team, and they went out and did mighty, mighty works. So Jesus is expecting us to move, to operate in this level. Even as we are seated with him at the right hand of God, Jesus is expecting us to operate in that kind of dominion. So we have to sort of change our thinking, change our actions to line up with what Jesus was saying we should do. As we know, like he's also said, the kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. So the kingdom of God allows people to press into it, to push into it to go all out into it, and it only yields up to those who are pressing forward. It will not fall on your lap. You have to change your thinking, change your actions, to actually take a hold of what Jesus has taken a hold of for you. Because we must, on this earth, before end times comes, we must walk in a demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God. 
in the way the Acts of the Apostles did. So Jesus has given us the challenge. He said, I have done it. I have given you my word, but now it is up to you to take my word and enforce it here on, on this earth. Are you ready for the challenge? Well, let's, let's go through and see how we can apply this to our lives. The first thing we have to do, though, is to think boldly, a bold thinking. Because like we know, as you think in your heart, that is the way you will act. You know, we, we human beings are different from animals. Animals are, are creatures of instinct. It is built in them. Birds know where to fly a certain period in time. Fish know where to swim to a certain period in time. But human beings, it's up to you. Your, your thoughts determine where you go. Even when you act in an emergency, it's because of the way your heart, you've been thinking in the past, your heart has been conditioned a certain way. Yeah, so our thinking is extremely important. You can put two people, same circumstance, and they'll act differently. One will rise, one will stay at one level, another one will fall. Why? Just because of the way they are thinking. And God expects us to change our thinking continuously. He says what? Be transformed by the renewal of your mind. If you ever catch yourself saying, or somebody saying that, as for me, this is the way I am. I've always been like this. Tell them no. You can change your mindset. Even in ed education now, the buzzword is growth mindset. That the mindset you have, you can grow. You can change it and become something new. God said this a long time ago, 2,000 years ago. So if you look at yourself, and five years ago you were thinking a certain way, and now you're still thinking the same way, you must check yourself and say, no way. I cannot remain the same. I must change my mind. Think the way God thinks. And it starts off with bold thinking. Let's go to 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. So 1 Chronicles chapter 4, verse 10. We'll look at a chap called Jabez. So it says, And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed, and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. The main thing you notice here is, Jabez said, enlarge my territory. God, I don't want to stay at the same level. Maybe he was doing slightly better than his peers, or the same as his peers. But Jabez says, I am not going to be comfortable. You must not assume a place of comfort. Yes, thank God for where he has brought you from. But don't stay still and say, well, I'm doing as good as my peers. Maybe I'm doing slightly better than them, slightly worse than them, but I'm okay here. No, 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 no. You must project your thoughts. Your thoughts must go way ahead of where you are at the moment. Because if you never overextend yourself, you will never grow. If everything you're doing, you can do it, that means you're not growing. You must do think things which you do not know how to do. If you ever have a thought and you think, I know how to do this, forget it. You're thinking too small. Your thoughts might be at a level where you think, how am I going to do this? I have to grow to reach those thoughts. And that is what God is saying. We need to start having bold thinking. Start thinking about enlarging our, our territories so that we can move up, like we said, for the kingdom of God. Think about this. You may say, well, I'm saved. God supplies all my needs. But there are 7.4 billion people in this world. I don't know how many are saved. Let's say, optimistically, 1 billion people are saved. That means over 6 billion people going, sleepwalking into hell forever and ever. And we have the solution. Jesus has given us the solution. He's given us the challenge that take this up and you can effect the change. So even if you're comfortable in your life, you must say no. For my brother's sake, the disciples, the apostles were not comfortable. They went all out so the gospel could come to us. So in whichever area God has set you to, to, you must say, no, my thinking must go ahead. I must things more, do things more boldly, do things more powerful. 
Let's see what God said. We see what Jabez did. Let's see what God said about thinking. If we go to Isaiah chapter 54, verses 1 to 3. So Isaiah 54, verses 1 to 3. So this is God speaking. He said, Sing, O barren, you who have not born, break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child, for more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. Verse 2, enlarge the place of your heart, of your tent. Tell somebody, enlarge the place of your tent. And let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your sticks. For you shall expand to the right and to the left, and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. In the Old Testament, God was talking about cities and stuff like that. In the New Testament, we are talking about the kingdom of God, to enlarge the kingdom of God. But first, God says, enlarge the place of your tent. In the spiritual, it will be enlarge the place of your heart, enlarge the place of your thinking. Because if your thoughts cannot get there, there is no way you will even think about acting together. So God has given us a commission. First of all, start thinking big things. If there's anything you're thinking about, enlarge it. Move it up. Move up to God's level. You know, sometimes you must think about God outside of church. Because when you think of God in church, sometimes it can be a bit religious. When you think of God outside the church, I like the universe. So I think of God like David says when he looks at the works of God's hands. You may like nature, you may like something else, but I like the universe. When I think about God, think about the universe. We've got the sun, we've got the moon, the earth rotating, pulling the moon, all of them going around the sun forever and ever with precision. I keep thinking, somebody sat down, thought about all this, and it's not magic. It can be calculated to the last dot. He thought about all these billions and billions of galaxies, and he made all this. And this same person has elevated me up to his level. God has not come down to my level. No. He's pulled me up to be seated with him at the right-hand side of God. So if he's pulled me up there and he's made me a partaker of the divine nature, that means my thoughts must also go up to his level. So God is saying, stop thinking the way you're thinking. Change the, the thoughts that you have. Elevate them up. Think big thoughts so that we can actually do big things here on this earth. If we look at some examples, for example, Joseph in Genesis chapter 37, read about Joseph. We all know about Joseph and his coat of many colors. He had a dream, a big vision. When he told his father and mother about the vision, they were like, what? Are we, the sun and the moon, going to bow down to you, young man? When he told his brothers, his brothers took it seriously. They thought, this guy, thinks he's going to rule over us. Let us get rid of him. So his vision was so big, his dream was so big, he did not know how to accomplish it. That is what your thinking must be. You must think thoughts you do not know how to accomplish. But he still thought big, and eventually it came to pass. You know, sometimes we think these things are just in the Bible. Jesus said the children of this world, this generation, sometimes are wiser, are smarter, in the waste and the children of light. I was looking at this one man. This whole earth, 7.4 billion of us, we've put about 3,000 working satellites into orbit. About 3,000 of them working. All of us, all the nations, America, China, everybody, we've put about 3,000 working satellites. One person has got up and says he's going to put 40,000 satellites into orbit. Not only is he thinking it, he's actually started putting it there. In a few years, he's going to achieve that. For more than 10 times what the whole world has done. Because he was boldly thinking and now he's boldly acting. So if a natural person can do this with natural means, how much more the sons of God who have the backing of Almighty God. So we must look at our thinking and start to elevate and stretch out our thinking. You know, when you read the Bible, sometimes the Bible can be a bit miraculous. Bring it into today's day. Look at David versus Goliath. 
Can you imagine if you're in an office block, a group of believers in an office block, and then suddenly, it doesn't normally happen in this country, it happens in other countries, there's a gunman on the loose. And everybody's running into the offices, locking the door. You can hear the gunman shooting, people screaming. You, you call the police, the police say we're on the way, so stay down. You've locked the door, you're all hiding. And then a young girl, 17-year-old girl gets up and says, nonsense, who is this person walking around? I'm going to face him and disarm him. What would you actually think? Would you say, oh yes, we believe you, go ahead. You look at her and say, my dear, stop this nonsense. Just sit down and hide. The police is coming. That is what David did. All the strong men of war were hiding, were cowering back from Goliath because they thought if we go against Goliath, certain death. This young man who's never fought a war before comes up and says, I will take him. His thinking had gone so far ahead. He didn't know how he was going to do it, but he knew based on the word of God that I should be able to do this. And so he projected his thinking. As his thinking went there, suddenly the resource to do it actually came. So we have to start thinking boldly and move our thoughts. If there's a project God has given you, yes, you may have to start small, but think global. Think big, stretch it out. Because the Bible says, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro to show himself strong to those whose hearts are upright towards him. He's trying to see who is actually thinking at my level. Who is thinking strong, powerful thoughts that I can show myself strong to. So if you look in your life and there are no strong, mighty demonstrations of the Spirit and the power of God, that means you are limiting God with your thinking. If I had to do this a while back, I was, was praying to God and I said to God, God, you haven't done anything awesome to me in the, in the last few months. Nothing awesome has happened. Something awesome should happen. And he looked at me and said, you are the one to make something happen. I have done everything that I'm going to do, give you my word, give you my spirit. Now you must make something happen. You must take action. Think big and then move in that direction to make it happen. Now, if you look at um, ways to think, two main ways to think. I mean, different ways to think, but two main ways. One, you can say, I'm going to make things better. Yeah, continuous improvement. So 10% better, 20% better. If you're very good, maybe 30, 40% better. So you look at your environment, the things you've got, the resources you have, your skills, your capabilities, and then you're continuously improving. So you do that at work every week, every month, you do that. That's good. But there's a different way to think when you think about making things different, totally different. Forget what you have now. Forget the resources. Just think, what would I want to happen? If I could possibly do anything, what is it I really want to happen? So maybe once a month or once a week, take an hour and think, how can my life be actually different and make a big impact? How can I change things to make things different? When you start, forget about how, when you start projecting your thinking there, then the Holy Spirit starts bringing things into your path. Read this book, listen to this message, meet this person. Suddenly, you start to see the possibilities. In the beginning, when you think of making it different, you can't see the possibilities. You cannot see have a clue what you're going to do. You could possibly think, I'm going to go on TV, not go, only go on TV, I'm going to go on BBC, ITV, and have a Christian show there. You think, how is that possible? Once you have fought it, then God starts to show you how it is possible. So you have to start, we have to start thinking these sort of thoughts. You might be evangelizing, going in the streets. You must start thinking, how can I actually do a conference, thousands of people come, rent Wembley, and actually evangelize there. You might think that's impossible. Unless your thoughts go there, God is not going to show you the way. If you keep looking at where you are, you have to stay there. In fact, that's the major difference between chickens and eagles. Chickens are content. The master's made a house for them. They come out in the morning. They put food on the floor. They pack the food. They just stay where they are. In the night, they go back. Have you ever seen a chicken looking up at the sky, wondering, 
what would it be like to fly? I wonder what is across there. Can I go and find if there's something new? You know, there's always this joke about why the chicken cross the road. Chickens don't cross the road. They stay where they are. They never go anywhere outside the environment. They are happy with their environment, comfortable. Like they say, my God is supplying my needs. What do I need to do? I'll just sit here and be comfortable. But eagles don't do that. Eagles soar. And when they soar, they want to go even higher and higher and higher. And the eagles see far, being thinking. They are looking far, visionary. And they are looking for strong meat. They are not looking for chicken feet. They are looking for strong meat. Yes, they have to fly and chase the live meat to find it, to get it. It's not easy, but they prefer that than living an easy, comfortable life with chicken feet. So we are born as eagles. We are not born as chickens. We are born as eagles. So we must elevate ourselves higher and say, how would God see this situation? What is God thinking? Let me elevate my thoughts so I can think the way God thinks. Because all the time, God is doing something new. If in the natural, we know all the good things that are happening actually comes from God, because all good things come from above, the Father of all lights. That means in the spiritual, God must want to do new things. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 43, verses 18 to 19. So Isaiah 43, 18 to 19. And God says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. So behold, see, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So God is saying, I'm going to do a new thing. And he says, see it. Because it will come. When the new thing came, the Pharisees and Sadducees couldn't see it. They were still stuck in the law. No, on the Sabbath you can't do this. Jesus came with a new way. They could not comprehend it. They could not grasp it. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness cannot comprehend, cannot take it. But God is saying, I'm doing a new thing. So in all our times, we must realize that God does new things. And we must elevate our thinking up to that level or else be left out. Or is God to move to another generation? Yeah, because when we look at the children of Israel walking in the desert, God says, enter into this new place. They said, no, 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 no. The people see us as grasshoppers. We ourselves see ourselves as grasshoppers. We are small. We are thinking small. We cannot enter. So God said, okay, you cannot enter. Wait, I will try the next generation. So this generation must say, no, 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 Father. We are not going to think small. We are going to elevate our thinking into the big things, into expanding your kingdom, demonstrating your spirit and your power. Like God says, who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? If you believe God's report, you believe that you were made for the demonstration of spirit and power. You believe that you can do mighty and great things. Then the arm of the Lord is revealed to you. But if you do not elevate your mind there, how can the arm? Of the Lord be revealed to you. So God wants to do a new thing in your life. He wants to do a mighty powerful thing in your life. It may be in ministry. It may be in business. It may even if you don't have a business, you are working, your words of power can pull your whole office to you. That's what Peter did. On the day of Pentecost, they were hiding away. They were afraid. You may be afraid to tell people in your workplace. When the power came, he just opened his mouth. Everybody, thousands of people getting saved. So we must elevate our thinking and say, God, I want a new thing to happen. And so I'm going to raise my thinking up to that. Yeah. Because we know that in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, where there's no vision, the people perish. Or the New King James says, where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. If there's no sight, if vision is looking far ahead, somewhere where you are not at the moment, out of sight, you can see the vision there, where you, there, you do move forward towards the vision. You don't know how to do it, but you are determined that once you can see it, you are going forward for it. It says the people perish. It means the people go back. They stagnate. They stay where you are. You must not stay 
where you are. You must move forward because there are territories to be taken. If we look at the father of faith himself, Abraham, I can see why God respected Abraham so much and loved Abraham so much and called him his friend. And he's the father of faith. If you look at the example of Abraham, God said to Abraham, lift up your eyes. So don't be like a chicken looking around. Lift up your eyes like an eagle. And, and look and see everything as far as you can see, I give it to you. So here again was saying, raise your thinking up. If your thinking can go up, I will give it to you. So I'm sure Abraham, he could have thought, okay, me, my family, Isaac, and my workers, if I look one mile across, that'd be good enough for us. That we'll have a nice, comfortable life. We'll be rich, we'll be wealthy. It'll be good for us. He could have done that. But no. He could have thought further and said, okay, for my descendants for all time, I want Israel. I'll think about the whole land of Israel. All my descendants will have it forever. He didn't think that. When you go to Romans chapter 4, verse 13, it says, when God made Abraham the heir of the world, Abraham saw the whole spinning world. His thinking elevated and said, no, I'm going to take all of it. So he thought about the whole world. He was able to project his thinking. He didn't know how he'd get the whole world, but he projected his thinking there. And God says, well done. I give it to your seed. And we know the seed is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul comes to teach us in the New Testament that the seed is one person, not seeds, not the children of Israel. So he just did not think about Israel. He thought about the whole world. So Jesus, God could give the whole world to his seed and we could have it. Yeah, so God is expecting us to start thinking big thoughts so he can reveal his arm to us. So tell somebody sitting next to you, start elevating your thoughts. Tell them, if you are thinking of doing something small, elevate it. Think of the whole world. Think globally. Think of expanding the kingdom of God. Okay, so that's the first thing, bold thinking. So you've expanded your thoughts, but the next thing is bold action. Because your thoughts alone will not accomplish it. Somebody needs to go out and do it. Like we know, faith without works is dead. So we need to put some action towards it. And if you want to look at people who have acted, you go to Hebrews chapter 11, the chapter of faith, you see strong action. I mean, you look at Noah. God told Noah, build an ark. No rain, no clouds. He took the action. Whilst yet there was no evidence of any rain coming. That's one thing we have to know about bold action. When God tells us to do something, sometimes we think, oh, the conditions are not right. I don't have the full resources. I don't know how to fully do it yet. So I'll wait for God to come and show me. Remember, nobody's waiting for God. God says, wait on me, not for me. Everything is there, but you have to make it happen here on the earth. Noah had to get people to come and help him build the ark. When he finished building the ark, then God said, enter, and then the ring came. If you had not finished, the rain would have been stayed. So God is waiting for you to take the bold action. Then the resources will be presented to you. So if you are still waiting for God to open a door, show you something to do before you start acting, you could be waiting a long time. If he tells you go, go. On your way, you will find the answer. Yeah, we all remember the story of the lepers. Jesus said, Go and show yourself. They didn't wait and tell Jesus, please, can you heal us first? Then we'll go. Once he had said, go, as they went, they found their healing and got their healing. And there's a famous story in 1 Samuel chapter 30 about David and his men. So he and the men of war went out to go and fight a battle. When they came back, some enemies had come, ransacked their whole village, taking their wives and their children and gone away. They didn't know where the people had gone. 
they sat, wept for a while. David went to ask God, God, what should I do? God said, go. He didn't know where to go. When God said go, God didn't say go left, go right. God said, just go. He didn't wait and say, I don't know where I'm going, so I'll wait. No, he took bold action. They went. As they went along the way, they met a young boy who showed them exactly, pointed out the right way. So if God has told you go, you must do what you can do now before the next step is revealed. If not, you'll be stuck there waiting forever. And one of the things I used to do after reading about some great men and women of God, you read about your stories, you hear some of them, when they were young, a bright light came. An angel appeared and told them things. And I thought, as I looked at Moses. Moses as well, burning bush came. I thought, okay. And then you look at Joseph. Joseph had a dream. David was there. Someone came and anointed him. So I went to God. God, let me see a light. Let me see an angel. Send somebody to show me something. God said, no, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. I said, why not? He said, let's go to Isaiah chapter 34, verse 16. You see what he told me. So in Isaiah chapter 34, verse 16, he says, search from the book of the Lord and read, not one of these shall fail, not one shall lack a mate, for my mouth has commanded it and his spirit has gathered them. So God is saying, I have enough promises. I've given you enough visions, enough dreams in the book. You go and search. All those people you are talking about did not have the Bible to go and search. Even the recent ones, sometimes they could not read or they, did not, they were not Christians yet. We are now in the position where we have a lot of the revealed will of God. God says, go and search through it and find. Find a promise a dream, a vision, and go for it. See how big the dreams, the visions of God are. You know, David, David was a prophet because he says, open my eyes so I'll see the wondrous things in your law, the mighty, the powerful, the big things in your law. So that you just don't read the Bible and go, oh, that's nice, praise God. No, it jumps at you. The eyes of your understanding flood with light so you know the exceeding greatness of God's power towards you. So it should really jump at you and say, no, this is a big vision. This is a big dream. I'm going to go for it. Now I was reading the, the Acts of the Apostle, and I just noticed Paul said something. He said God had called him to see the righteous one and to hear from him. And I was like, what? So Paul was actually seeing Jesus. You see many accounts, Jesus was standing next to him, hearing directly for Jesus. I thought, what? I'm also in the kingdom of God. If he's in the kingdom of God and he's getting this access, why can't I also get it? But you must see it in the Bible and take it seriously and run with it. You know, if you joined a new company and they gave you the benefits book of the company and you were reading through the benefits and you saw something about a pension and they said, whatever amount you put into the pension, the company will put 10 times. And you read, you go past and go, what? Did I read it right? You go, we will put 10 times. And so you go to your manager and say, I just seen this thing, is it true? The manager says, oh, I think it's true. You ring HR, you tell HR, I think you've got a zero next to the one. It should be one time. They say, no, 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 we are serious, it's 10 times. Would you let it go? Would you think, oh, that's nice, and get on with your life? Stay in your comfortable zone? No way. You come back and tell your family, say, family, this month, all the pay is going to the pension. We're going to get 10 times. Nobody's eating this month. We're not buying anything this month. We're going to get 10 times what we put in. You will take direct action. Whatever you need to do to put as much money in that pension, you do it because you can see a great benefit. This book of the law is filled with wondrous benefit, supernatural things, mighty things, Yes, it demands, one, your thinking goes large, and two, your bold action takes, takes over. By the same way I was talking about, about a pension, you would have taken bold action. You would have cut back everything to put in it. Because you say, what, 10 times? 
will be enjoying one day. So it's the same with this. You have to look at it, see it, and actually run with it. Don't, thank, don't just thank God for it. Thank him, worship him, but hold on to his word. Like somebody says, give him no rest. Don't let God get away with giving such huge, mighty promises and nothing is done about it. Yeah. One thing that can restrict people, especially people of faith, it's funny, people of faith are almost afraid to try big things because it seems in our community, if you try something big and then you fail, people will say, oh, I thought you were a man of faith. I thought you were a woman of faith. Did it not work? So everybody's afraid. You want to test the water small, you're afraid. Because if you do it, it doesn't work. Those people will start pointing fingers and saying, ah, it did not work. Oh, they did not have faith. I thought they had faith. It's a total misconception about faith. Nobody gets anything just by faith. No. The Bible says, through faith and patience, you inherit the promise. Abraham did not get it just by faith. He failed many times. And by with patience, then he got it. So don't be afraid of doing and failing. You will, in fact, to be honest, you will fail a few times. Failure is part of the process. So don't be afraid of failure. In fact, you have to look at failure. You can look at failure two ways. One way of looking at failure is God has told you something. You do it, it fails. Failure is just coming up to you. She's telling you, no, 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 no. You are going the wrong way. There's a roadblock there. If you go this way, the bridge has fallen down, you crash. You are going the wrong way. Go and find out how to do and go the right way. So you should thank failure. Say, failure, thank you so much. You go back, review what you were doing, ask people who have done it before, what, you do, what, what am I doing wrong? What do I need to change? Find out from the Bible. Find out from God. Find out, you find out, oh, I was doing this wrong. I need to change my direction. So you should thank failure. Don't blame failure and be afraid of failure. Failure can also be looked at as another way. You are going to the conference. You've got a ticket. You're entering the conference. There's this big belly bouncer there say, no, 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 no. I'm not going to allow you in. And you go, what? I've got the ticket. I'm doing what God says to do. I must enter. And failure say, no, you don't look over 18. You look below 18. It's only over 18 years, so you can't enter. So you go back home, take your driver's license, try again, do it again. Failure looks at your driver's license and says, this looks fake. You can't come in. Will you go back to God and say, well, God, I tried it twice. It's not working. I paid 300 pounds for the ticket, but I can't get in there, so I'll go home. Is that what you would do? Is that what you would do? Bet not. You will take the driver's license, look for any police car and say, Sir, I've got my driver's license. This man is trying to stop me to get in, into the conference. When you start going there with the police, then failure will say, Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know it was you. And opens the door for you to go. You need persistence. Greatness is doable, but you need persistence. Nobody did anything great, anything mighty, without apparently failing once or twice. You read about Abraham Lincoln, over eight major failures until he succeeded, highest office, and now one of the greatest presidents ever. Even your Lord Jesus, some people would have said he failed. Yes, Jesus, he takes his whole entourage. He's going to do a crusade in a, in a town. Takes all his members, all his equipment. He enters the town. There's a man possessed by demons. He casts out all the demons. Major miracle. You would have thought, he's done one major miracle. Good. The crusade is going to proceed. The people from the town come, see the miracle. They look at Jesus. No, 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 no. Leave this town. We don't want you. You're not going to have any crusade. We're not going to allow you to have any crusade. You can't even stay here one night. Leave now. Jesus had to go. You had to pack all his people and tell the man he had just delivered, you go and tell people about me. He had to leave. If you were looking from a distance, you saw by Jesus' field, I thought he was a man of faith. Man of faith went all the way to do a crusade. He couldn't even spend one day there, and they sacked him. You would have thought he was a failure. But maybe failure was saying to him, my Lord, you are not needed here. 
just send this man you have delivered. He will do the job for you. In fact, when you read the Bible, the man went around spreading the word throughout the whole Decapolis. So failure was just telling him, no, no, you are not needed here. You are needed somewhere else more urgent. And in fact, when he went somewhere else, the crowds gathered and accepted him. So do not be afraid of failure. In fact, if you go into any community and the people there, a lot of them have not failed. That means they are not doing. They are just staying in their comfort zone. They are not trying to overextend themselves. They are not trying to do something they don't know how to do or have never done before in their life. They are just being comfortable doing the things they can do. Because if you go to a community and you see a lot of people who have failed, it means they are pushing themselves. They are pushing, it seems to fail, they go back, they use persistence, keep pushing forward until the door is opened. There's this famous story in Judges chapter 20. It's a fascinating story. The children of Israel were going to war against one tribe, the Benjamins. Imagine the children of Israel were over 400,000. That one tribe was just about 26, 27,000 people. They asked God, should we go against our brother? God says go. First time they went, they were beaten. Don't think of just failure. Thousands of soldiers were dying. They came back to God. God says, yes, go. I will give you the victory. Second time they went, they were beating even more severely. More thousands dying. They could have given up and said, well, what's our problem? We are not under attack. We can stay in our town, let them stay in their town. But no, they went back to God. This time, all their families fasting and praying offering sacrifices to God, saying, God, we must win this war. God says, yes, go, you will definitely win. And they changed their strategy of how to fight, how to fight. They changed their plans, and this time they got the victory. So don't let us leave the promises of God just like that. Like we're saying, don't let God get away with giving these huge promises. Let's go through the book, find the promise, elevate our thinking and start taking massive, bold action. So let's be like Caleb in the book of Joshua 14, verse 12. Caleb said to Joshua, give me this mountain and I'll take it. He didn't even say, God has told me to take the mountain. He said, if God, if God is willing, he will give it to me. So he had decided, I am going to take it anyway because it belongs to the children of Israel. So let's go forward, let's press into this kingdom, think bold thinking, and start taking bold action. Amen. Somebody just worship God. Just thank God for the word of God. Thank God for sending you his word, sending you his word for your spirit, to invigorate your spirit, to quicken your spirit, so that you walk in the divine nature, you walk in the supernatural, so that you see what he's saying. Thank God for sending your word to your soul, to your mind, to renew your mind so you are transformed. Transformed and you walk in the image of Christ. That you walk in success. You do what Christ did. Thank God for sending his word for your body, for your flesh. Medicine to your flesh. Quickening your flesh. Giving you health. Giving you vitality. Giving you strength. and Giving you long life. We thank you so much, Father, for your word. We give you the glory, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, do we pray? Okay, we're going to pray. I pray in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16. We just pray this prayer. Because it's one thing to know what to do, it's another thing actually to have the strength to do it. Ephesians 3 16 says, That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. So raise up your voice, self, tell your father, strengthen me with might in my inner man to think boldly about your promises, to act boldly, to act persistently to get those promises to come to pass. Father, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for giving us your spirit, Father. We ask that you strengthen us with might, with miracle-working power, with dynamics, with dynamic ability, Father, with drive, with great boldness, great courage to 
push forward, to think boldly, Father, to act boldly, to be persistent, Father, to break the boundaries, break the ceilings, Father, and to move ahead, Father. Strengthen us with might by your spirit, by the spirit of might, Lord my God, so we will do the wondrous things that you have set for us to do. We give you the glory, Father. We give you the praise. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, this message really is for the children of God. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your Savior, today is the day. Today, Jesus extends his hand out to you. He says, I came to save you. I came to give you God's kind of life. I came to save you for the coming judgment. If you believe that the Lord Jesus Christ came and died for you to wash away your sins, that God raised him up from the dead. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior, the Son of the Most High God. Today, he's extending his hand to you. So if you want to receive him, just say this quick prayer after me. Lord Jesus, I accept you as my Savior. I accept you as my Lord. I believe that you died for my sins. And I believe that you were raised up from the dead. I believe that you're the Son of God. And I take you as my Savior. Thank you so much, Lord Jesus, for saving me. If you've just said this prayer, welcome into the kingdom of God. You've come into the right place. There are great and mighty things are ahead of you. And heaven is already your home because you have been born again. I think you'll see on the notice there how you can contact us so we can send you material about this new life and try and join a good church, a word-based church. We are still online, so you can join us online. And if you can, when things get back to normal, we worship in the Kilburn area. But do contact us. Let us know so we can send you material. We can keep in touch with you. Because we are like a newborn baby. You need to be fed. You need to be looked after to grow up in this world. Amen. Okay, I'm going to pray for those who are sick. If there's any sickness in the body, we're going to use the name of Jesus. Jesus says, Whatsoever you shall ask in my name, I will do it. So if you place your hands on where the sickness is, I'm going to command that sickness to go in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, I command you spirit of infirmity to leave their bodies now in Jesus Christ's name. And I speak to your bodies, be healed, be completely made whole in the name of Jesus. Pain, leave that body. Sickness, leave that body now. In the name of Jesus Christ. Eyesight be fully recovered. Be strengthened in your eyesight now. Your limbs, your back be strengthened now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And anybody with mental problems. Anybody with mental problems. For I speak to your mind now. Be clear of that. You spread of empty. Leave their minds now. I break that hold of their mind. In the name of Jesus Christ. Be made whole now. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Can rejoice, move about, whatever you could not do before, do it now. Put your faith to action because the healing virtue has come into you. So put your faith to action in the name of Jesus. Okay, we're going to go to our offering. It's offering time. Are you ready to give? Well, let's go to Genesis chapter 8. We'll read from verse 20 to 22. A bit long, but... You get the point. So Genesis chapter 8, verse 20. It says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and took of every clean animal and of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a soothing aroma. Then the Lord said in his heart, I will never again curse the ground for man's sake. Although the imaginations of man's heart is evil from his youth, nor will I again destroy every living thing as I have done. While this, this earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night shall not cease. Yeah, so Newton found this law. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. But the difference with this action is you put a seed in the ground. You don't get a seed back. You get timber, 
you get leaves for medicine, you get fruit as well. You get lots and lots of benefits. So when you sow your seed, have the faith that it is going to produce more and more and more. And also you notice something. When Noah offered a sacrifice, it, it's, it was a sweet-smelling aroma to the Most High God. So not only are your sacrifices going to multiply back to you, when it goes up to God, remember, Jesus is a high priest, so he takes your offerings towards the Most High God and becomes a sweet-smelling aroma to the Most High God. So you can give online. I think you get the details online. And God richly bless you and multiply your seed as he has said and he's faithful. Amen. through some announcements it's a reminder for children's church you have your zoom session today so for kinder and super it's 5 p.m and for over the hill gang you have yours at 6 p.m so this evening gather your children around so 5 p.m kinder and super 6 p.m for over the hill gang but tic your zoom session is on friday the 18th at 7 p.m. as usual. We have OFN fellowship meetings via Zoom. So I think we did that the last time. It went very well, very successful. Pastor Kofi and Pastor Jane joined their OFN Zoom meetings and it went wonderfully. So we, these are happening again. So we've got the OFN South and OFN West Zone. Yours is coming up on Saturday the 19th of June from 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. So that's this Saturday, 7 p.m. to 8 p.m. That's the South and West Zone. Then next is the OFN Mid Hertz Zone. That'll be on Sunday, the 20th of June, from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. So next Sunday, Mid Hertz. And then the OFN North and East Zone, yours will be on Saturday, the 26th of June, at 7 to 8 p.m. And finally, OFN Northwest Zone. You'll have yours on Sunday, the 27th of June, from 7.30 to 8.30 p.m. So from next week, Saturdays and Sundays, we'll be having the OFN Zoom session. So make sure you take a note of when your OFN time is, and I'm sure your leaders will send you the link and come participate because it's a fantastic time, a time of fellowship. And I'm sure Pastor Kofi might have an update about things for us anyway. Okay. Well, have a great week. Remember, remember to like, share, comment, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Send it, to your, send it to your friends, your enemies on WhatsApp and spread the word out. And God richly bless you. Have a great week.
it's love so 